Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you here today on World Mental Health Day to our first panel of the new academic year. My name is Kevin Quigley. I'm the scholarly director of the McKechnie Institute for Public Policy and Governance. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're here today on traditional Mi'kmaq territory. We also recognize the histories, contributions, and legacies of the African Nova Scotian people who've been here for over 400 years. Since its inception in 2016, the goal of the McCacken Institute has been to inform the development of progressive public policy through robust debate, discussion, and research. Today, our panelists will be focusing on how we approach mental health and addictions care. In the wake of the ongoing pandemic and opioid crisis, the need to approach mental health and addictions care as an essential part of overall wellness has never been more apparent. But as our panelists will discuss, there are many barriers that are preventing vulnerable populations from accessing the care they need. Today's panel coincides with the release of a briefing note produced in partnership with Dalhousie's Faculty of Medicine entitled Roundtable with Health Leaders, Mental Health and Substance Use Care in Canada. This briefing note, which is the first of three that will be released over the coming weeks, summarizes the findings of a roundtable discussion on challenges and opportunities in mental health and substance use care identified by 20 professionals in the fields of public health, in medicine, social work, psychiatry and psychology and government, and included diverse views from indigenous and other equity seeking groups. This roundtable took place last June following the FEAR Memorial Conference on Catalyzing Health Systems Change and was facilitated by one of our panelists today, Dr. Laura Hazelton. Our speakers today are a great example of the kind of experts we bring together at the McKechnie Institute to advance these important policy discussions each of our four panels brings a unique perspective to the discussion based on their experiences in the field of mental health and substance use care. Each of our speakers will deliver some opening remarks followed by a moderated discussion. After the discussion, we'll have an audience Q&A period. Feel free to type your questions into the chat box throughout the panel discussion. When we begin the q and I'll pose as many of these audience questions to our speakers as I can. Our first speaker today is Dr. Sam Hickox. He's a physician consultant with the Provincial Office of Addictions and Mental Health. He's a certified specialist in addiction medicine and a practicing family physician. Thanks for joining us this morning, Dr. Hickox, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Great to be here. Um, I, I have a limited amount of time, so I'm just gonna launch into my uh, opening comments. Um, I'm hoping to provide a little bit of context uh, uh, to help answer the question, how do we find ourselves here? And uh, in order to set things up for discussion about uh, where to go next from a policy perspective, thinking about uh, culture, history, society, and how it uh, intersects with um, our current, uh, uh, our current uh, mental health uh, system uh, and a vision of a mentally healthy Nova Scotia. <clears throat> so to start off, one important piece of historical context is that in the past decade or two, the stigma associated with talking about mental health has reduced significantly. Um, even events like Bell's uh, Let's Talk uh, uh, campaign uh, have, have been uh, taken up by many. And uh, I think there's been a generational shift in normalizing discussions about mental health. Uh, in addition, uh, to some degree, um, there is uh, a growing acceptance that mental health is a component of health care, and therefore any healthcare system should incorporate, uh, should, should have mental health as part of the system, not necessarily siloed off and, and, uh, and segregated. Uh, I think a, a really telling example of this uh, was uh, during the, uh, the, uh, um, the core years of the COVID-19 pandemic, 2020, 2021, and 22, there was significant uh, media discussion and discourse uh, during that pandemic about uh, the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of, uh, of uh, individuals, of Canadians and Nova Scotians, and um, the impact that uh, uh, restrictions uh, uh, may be having on, uh, on mental health. And in addition, uh, 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 there was significant research done on the impact of uh, of the pandemic and the restrictions on uh, well-being, with a focus on um, inequitable distribution of uh, adverse uh, uh, effects on on mental health, 
And I think this kind of discourse may not have been as, predom uh, as prevalent, uh, say 20, 30 years ago as it is, uh, as it is now. Uh, this has uh, had many benefits, including an increase in individuals seeking and receiving uh, mental health supports. Although I think there's still a significant amount of work to be done for people to be able to recognize uh, and, uh, and respond with a degree of mental health literacy to uh, uh, whatever is going on for themselves or their loved ones. Um, it's also led to an increase in attributing one's emotional distress in particular as signifying pathology uh, and mental illness, uh, regardless of whether or not um, an individual's uh, circumstances, uh, how they feel, what they're thinking and their behaviors are actually best situated in the context of a mental illness. Um, there's an increase in, uh, in self-diagnosis uh, happening, and uh, this is, uh, generally speaking, people who are asking questions about whether or not they may or may not have a mental illness. Uh, and I think that this is all, you know, generally a good thing, but uh, it, has its, uh, it has its challenges as well that are shaping discourse around mental health and mental health care, um, in, and including in Nova Scotia. There are lots of people suffering in Canada for all sorts of reasons. And uh, suffering is uh, uh, an, um, a perennial problem. It's uh, it's uh, the pr the issue uh, the problems of suffering and runs the entire uh, history of uh, the written language uh, um, across uh, human societies, um, and uh, is the uh, uh, is the subject of many world religions, as well and spiritual practices, as well as uh, uh, philosophy. Uh, and uh, reasons for suffering can include unaddressed, un untreated uh, mental illness, other physical health issues. Suffering can be due to uh, being on the receiving end of social injustice. Um, uh, this day and age, uh, there are uh, particular factors contributing to human suffering, including the inherent dissatisfaction associated with consumerism, the endless quest for one more click for one more item on Amazon, uh, being uh, the solution to the emptiness that people sometimes feel inside. A loss of trust in authority figures and in tr uh, traditional institutions, including uh, uh, distrust of religious institutions and religious narratives, uh, which historically people have found solace in. Uh, overall alienation and isolation that comes from uh, a late industrial consumer capitalist uh, structuring of society, as well as urbanization, and the influence of technology, particularly communication technology and social media on how we relate to other people. Some would say that we spend too much time on our devices and not enough time spent just in the presence of each other. Um, we have access to overwhelming amounts of information, uh, including uh, global media events, and yet are often left uh, without a sense of power to respond to those. Uh, events and to uh, and at times are feeling that there's just too much information coupled with too many expectations about how we should be in the world as uh, presented in uh, social media. Uh, not enough time spent in nature, not enough time spent in an embodied way in our bodies moving. Um, traditional ways that we've dealt with suffering in uh, uh, many different cultural contexts and historical contexts includes uh, activities in which we feel a sense of communion and connection to other people, being with our people. That can happen in ritual spaces or just by virtue of living in small communities. Uh, getting support and supporting others in challenging times is an ethos that really helps to mitigate suffering. Religious and spiritual practices, seeking solace from religious leaders, from our elders. Um, so uh, and we and we see in our in our culture our society an erosion of these of these uh, traditional methodologies to uh, deal with suffering. Uh, the pandemic itself has exposed inequities, uh, and that includes inequities in impacts uh, of isolation and economic uncertainty on our well-being. Um, it has also shown. Um, the uh, tremendous need that we have to be in groups, to come together and to engage in activities, which in, to some degree are surrogates for religious communion, such as uh, sporting events or concerts, um, as well as uh, being connected with people in person in the workplace. This coupled with the increasing narratives related to mental health 
has amplified the drive to turn to mental health professionals when we are in any kind of crisis, when we feel aversive emotion, emotions, such as sadness, anxiety, fear, anger. Um, but the core function of the formal mental health system is to identify, diagnose, and treat mental illness, not necessarily to address all human suffering. As a result, in the public narrative, the mental health system is frequently perceived as a system that doesn't meet our needs. An example to illustrate how this works in the medical world is an individual can present to an emergency department in Nova Scotia with chest pain, wondering and actually in a state of anxiety about whether or not they're having a heart attack. They may be uh, receiving care and treatment uh, from the emergency department physicians. Perhaps they'll see a cardiologist. And more times than not, um, uh, they are uh, reassured after uh, an evaluation that they don't actually have a heart condition and that uh, their, uh, their symptoms are benign. To people, this is, uh, presents a, a, a source of relief and a sense that the system is working for them. But in mental health care, often when we present to uh, entities like emergency departments and we're told that we don't have a mental illness, uh, we're left feeling abandoned, hopeless, and still living with our aversive emotions. So the way forward is not to uh, is not to force the mental health system to do something it can't, but to broaden our definition of what a mental health system is and that that system should include work not only to build mental health awareness and reduce stigma and resiliency, but the building of skills, skills to manage our emotions, to recognize and respond to them. Um, we have actually evolved to experience all the emotions that we do experience and they help to tell us that something isn't right. They ideally function to draw us together, to motivate us to seek help and support and to reach out to others. They are a mechanism to help strengthen uh, communities. And ultimately a mentally healthy Nova Scotia consists of at its base, resilient communities, not just skilled individuals, people availing themselves of each other, helping each one, sharing and supporting. We cannot resolve human suffering, nor is, it, is the response to any, nor is the response to any particular crisis, be it a pandemic or geopolitical uncertainty, the tragedy of a mass casualty event, uh, one in which we can resolve the suffering associated with it. But we can try to create communities in which we mourn together, help each other, and respond to current crises with collective action. This is not to say that we don't need a formal mental health system for those who are experiencing mental illness. And we need to ensure that that system is well invested in, it's enhanced, that it grows. We need to keep our foot on the gas there. But we also require, especially at this time of health human resource crisis, um, to find ways to inspire action and invest in organizations which empower non-professionals and professionals who perhaps are not formal mental health professionals uh, to uh, contribute to a system in which we're all helping each other. Thanks. Excellent, thanks, Sam. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Laura Hazelton. She's the deputy head and director of education in the Department of Psychiatry, as well as the co-director of the Faculty Development for the Faculty of Medicine. She's also been a practicing psychiatrist for over 20 years. Laura, over to you. Great. Um, thanks, uh, Kevin. And thanks. I always appreciate hearing uh, Sam talk as well. And I think he did an excellent job of summarizing some of the challenges that I would say exist in the, the mental health system. So I bring a, a couple of perspectives to um, what I'm going to, to say. One is the perspective of having been a psychiatrist for um, over 23 years now working uh, currently in community mental health. Um, and But then also uh, what I really, my area of expertise or, or specialization probably is actually medical education. And so I think a lot about how we can prepare uh, physicians because that's the area that I, you know, that I work, medical students, um, psychiatry, residents, psychiatrists, and um, and family physicians, and, and so forth, how we can prepare people not only to deliver mental health care, um, but also to work within a complex system like mental health and to contribute 
um, the most appropriately into the scope of um, our expertise. Um, because I very much agree with what Sam was saying about the idea that mental health, which you might separate out from mental illness. Sometimes people talk about mental illness and mental health differently. Mental health um, is very broad, the same way that physical health would include exercise and, and diet. Mental health includes things like stress management and really all of us, like we have a physical health, we all have a mental health as well. Um, but not everybody has physical illnesses and not everybody has mental illnesses, but it, it is often, as I think Sam was alluding to with his example, his great example of chest pain, it's often really hard or harder to really define the difference between mental health and mental illness, perhaps. And then also um, to not allow, to figure out what does happen next if people are not diagnosed with a formal mental illness and entering the, let's say, mental illness uh, system as opposed to the mental health system, which maybe is, it could be argued is, is slightly different. So um, the things that I was thinking about as, as Sam was talking, and I've made a few notes if people see me looking down. So I think um, understanding, again, the scope for uh, physicians. So physicians, even though we do try to, to teach people about um, health and, and incorporate health into our, our practice, we're, we're kind of designed to be thinking about uh, illness and for psychiatrists in particular, um, just in case there is anybody on the call who isn't familiar with like a psychologist versus a psychiatrist, which I, I'll be honest, when I was a medical student, I didn't know the difference when I started out. So a uh, psychiatrist is somebody who's been to medical school. So an MD, like myself, I'm an MD, and then does another five years of specialty training as a resident. And uh, that would be similar to become, let's say, a cardiologist or a pediatrician or something. You would do additional training after medical school. So a psychiatrist or a family physician. So, uh, you know, a psychiatrist has done uh, training in medicine. And as such, our training is inevitably very medically based, even though we, we do try to look at a biopsychosocial model of um of human existence really. So not just biological, but psychological factors and social factors as well. Inevitably, our kind of unique contribution, I would say within the mental health system, um, mental health care system is really around probably the, med the medical model um, that we would bring that knowledge, expertise and, and perspective and identity. Um, and uh, so this is where if somebody, for example, has, um, you know, a severe and persistent mental illness, uh, some forms of schizophrenia or, or bipolar disorder, where certainly I don't want to minimize the role that community organizations play because it is an important role and there's many social determinants of health that, that influence how these ex illnesses are experienced. But what psychiatrists can bring, you know, is the, the knowledge of medications that might be helpful in that situation, um, you know, specialized care for people. And I think one of the challenges for in community mental health is that we get a very wide range of referrals, people with anxiety or other conditions, um, even as, as um, Sam said, you know, sometimes conditions that maybe are not even pathology, but just loneliness, or I shouldn't say just loneliness, <laughs> loneliness is a very serious problem, but loneliness or lack of purpose and meaning and responses to life stresses and so forth. So um, there's a quote by a, a psychiatrist from a book called Symptoms in the Mind that I read when I was a, a resident training 20 years ago. It still influences me a lot. Expert knowledge of the abnormal does not preclude ignorance of the normal. In other words, a psychiatrist can know a lot about mental illness and not know a lot about normal um, ex human experience. So when we try to expand our scope broadly there's advantages and I, I don't want to it, it's a it's a tension and I, I don't even know where I fall every every day on this but it's a tension between those people who really need the specialized care of, of psychiatrists and those who might benefit from the more general counseling skills that hopefully we're teaching our residents and you know just a, a sort of a side about that as well I think this is kind of what Sam was alluding another thing that I think about is that help seeking is not the same as, as help needing. So sometimes the people in our, our society who really need mental health help, for example, again, people with schizophrenia who might have, you know, that, that be unwell at the time, having experiencing psychosis, they might not perceive that they even actually need treatment. Whereas, um, so help seeking, uh, often people who seek help do need help, but there are people who don't seek help who also need help. And then how do we not become overwhelmed as a as a system so that we can't identify 
and help those people who would benefit from our help who necessarily aren't the ones who are who are coming to our clinics and, and so forth. So so it is it is very complex. And the other thing I just want to say, and I, I know I've got limited time here, but about education. So again, the way that we've tended to educate psychiatrists has and medical professionals in general has been in the um you know, the academic center, the traditional academic center. And it has been very much based on the illness model. And despite what I said, that that is sometimes the unique contribution we can make, it shouldn't be the only contribution that we make. And how do we educate um, medical students, residents, uh, physicians to be effective contributors to the systems that we're in? Um, so that we're not just looking at the patient in front of us, but we're thinking about this broader question of how can we be responsible to the system? How can we be responsible to society? How can we advocate? How can we partner with you know nonprofit organizations that do so much important work in the um, in the uh, in the the mental health care space? Um, and how do we uh, have our training happen in non-traditional places, such as outside of Halifax or in services, um, placements where people aren't paid to take our learners? How are we able to actually expand our training for the for those um, settings? So those are just a couple of things that I wanted to to mention, and um, again to to build on what Sam was saying about how human experience is is complex and diverse, and there is suffering, and what is the best way for us to respond and for us to um, prepare our learners to respond as well. So over to you, Ken. Thanks, Laura. Uh, I see we are starting to get some questions in on the chat. So I'm just ask uh, one of the things we ask people to do when they're posting is if you can direct your question to one person in particular, so I'll know how to direct that question, uh, just so that we can get through as many questions as we can. So it would be helpful if you can direct a question, though the panelists always have the option to jump in and answer any question they like. We do ask people to direct a question to one person in particular. Our next speaker is Alexis Goth. Uh, Dr. Alexis Goth, pardon me. She's a hospitalist at the QE2 Health Sciences Center and an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine at Dahasa University. She also operates her own consultative health clinic in Bedford. Over to Dr. Goth. Okay, hi there. Thanks so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here. And I just wanted to name as I'm listening to everyone, I'm really moved by the amount of attention and compassion that I'm hearing. And I think it helps us all when we're creating new models to remember that everyone, you know, leaders, policyholders, uh, makers, clinicians, clients, families are all really genuinely trying their best. And we remember that from a heart place, it's really easier for us all to engage in, in co-creating a better place. Um, so just a little bit of background on myself. I've trained as a family physician, but I've been practicing integrative medicine for the last 12 years, and uh, then went on to be trained in functional medicine and more recently in psychedelic assisted medicine. But I joined uh, the Integrated Chronic Care Service in Fall River in 2016, and that's when a lot of my interest in complex stress really began. I was asked to work there, really doing more of a body-based approach for folks with uh, complex conditions like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, gut dysfunction. And what I began to understand is most of those folks had early childhood trauma. All of them had some variation of trauma. Many of them had either formal diagnosis of PTSD, depression, um, and generalized anxiety, or at least had symptoms of these conditions. And when we began working with them in small groups, in small collectives, really introducing them to the idea of a nervous system regulation, uh, education around self-regulation, co-regulation, looking at sleep, looking at all these factors that actually had less to do from maybe um, a traditional uh, talk therapy approach, but were very body-based approach. Not only were their physical symptoms improving, but their mental health was improving. And it really, really piqued my interest on in how broadly we can begin considering mental health. And I think really the the precipice we're at really now, which feels to me like a cultural um, bridge that we're crossing, a bridge of consciousness, we're having kind of a shift in our awareness, is really the recognition that a mental health experience is inseparable from someone's physiological experience. And even though traditionally these have been you know, the mind-body separation is, is a lengthy separation in history. It's really time to unify this principle that we can no longer speak about mental health without speaking about our gut, what's happening with our dietary intake, with what's happening with our neurohormonal axis or our central nervous system. And the benefit when we have these conversations is one, I think it, it can take the load off of the traditional mental health care practitioners to, to have the only solution with mental health. We can remember that it's a unifying whole person experience, that holism is 
we are, you know, inseparable um, from within ourselves, that all parts are interdependent and interconnected. And we can begin eliciting the benefit and the, the, the practical knowledge of other healthcare practitioners, such as occupational therapists, physiotherapists, somatic-based workers, um, body-based workers who could actually help us begin to utilize the body as a mechanism by which we can engage in our mental health experience. So an example is the work coming out of HeartMath, a group out of California the last 30 years have been showing that when we bring conscious awareness to our physical body, to our heart, and when we begin changing our breathing pattern, we can actually interrupt our autonomic nervous system in real time. And that can have a really significant impact on some of the feelings and activations and the stress response that we attribute to symptoms like generalized anxiety and depression. Now this, you know, to Laura's statement is not necessarily practical or applicable when people are mentally ill and they don't have the awareness and insight to engage, but there's a large population that I feel can engage with body-based practices. And I think really naming this and offering access through body-based awareness can really be um, a point of action that we're not looking at. And then to extend that, just like what um, uh, both these speakers were speaking of, our need for social connection, as was shown to us through um, COVID, became very clear that we are such socially connected uh, species as humans. When we have social isolation, we really suffer because of it. And can the delivery of this care model actually offer us the resilience that we can find in community as part of the model? So I've become very curious, again, because of my Fall River days, about offering care in small group community practices. So this would be imagine four to eight people, small community groups, where there's a shared experience, there's a, maybe a shared theme, whether it's education, but also experientials. And what happens happens is not only is the strain off the system to deliver one-to-one -one care, there's less clinician burnout, there's more sense of, of um, just fortitude in the physician or, the, or the, the clinician that they're offering care instead of one person to eight people at a time. And the community of practice, the, the sentiment and the, the feeling of hope and resilience that builds within the community is itself so powerful. These people go on to have friendships, have connections, social connections outside of the medical model. Um, the last thing that I'd like to speak about, and that I know we just honored the Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th, is I think it's also time, again, this is a shift in our conscious awareness, that we begin making room for spirit, that we actually make room for the spiritual dimension of health. It has not been named, certainly in my training, it was not named, but when we think about the two-eyed um, vision, the two-eyed uh, watching that was described in 2004, pardon me, by uh, my elder Albert Marshall, we can begin witnessing from both lenses. We can watch from a more traditional indigenous lens that understood interconnectivity, that understood natural cycles, that understood our interwebbed connectiveness to all things. And we can watch from the Western model, which is showing us all the advances that we can pull into our awareness right now with you know, neuroplasticity and EMDR and gut microbiome. And really what happens when we have the courage to really witness from these two spaces and truly reconcile. I think it's a really interesting opportunity when we speak about reconciliation, what if we reconciled in a very practical, fundamental way through healthcare and begin listening to what our indigenous um, people have never forgotten, that we've forgotten in the West, but they've never forgotten. And I think it's a really interesting time to be reminded of these practices. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Goth. Um, we're now going to turn to uh, Karen Nichols. She's the executive director of the Canadian Mental Health Association, Nova Scotia Division, as an active community volunteer, sitting on boards and several impact organizations. Over to you, Karen. Thanks so much, Kevin. And uh, thanks to everyone who's here today. Thanks for organizing this. I'm really appreciating the conversation and um, uh, kind of imagining, uh, you know, uh, a system, a, a, a complex system where the work that we do at the community level can kind of um, engage with all of these uh, thoughts around what is needed in community. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time kind of demystifying the kind of work that we do so that um, it may become clear, you know, as we kind of continue this conversation. So 
Um, I'm the executive director of the Canadian Mental Health Association. We're uh, the Nova Scotia division. I am not a clinician, although uh, in our federation across the country, there are many divisions that are um, have arms of that division that are um, clinically oriented and actually kind of complement the kind of programming that is happening in the community. But you, I just thought I'd give a little bit of background on CMHA Nova Scotia, because often I find that there's a, a real lack of brand awareness, particularly here in Nova Scotia. So we're part of the most extensive community-based mental health network uh, across Canada. We're uh, what they call a federated charity, which means we're a collective of organizations that were bound together by our brand and our mission. And together, we identify and respond to our most pressing mental health priorities. So at the national level, we push for a nation nationwide uh, system and policy change. And then at the community level, millions of people in Canada rely on our extensive grassroots presence. It shows up in a bunch of different ways. There are 330 CMHA divisions and branches across this country, and these branches and divisions employ about 7,000 staff and uh, 11,000 members and volunteers. And we've been active in communities across Canada for over a hundred years. And our combined Nova Scotia operation, which is really the division, which is provincial, provincially mandated, and then the branches, which is more grassroots uh, local. We employ about 55 staff and 72 volunteers. And we're part of groups of social impact sector that are over about 6,000 strong across the province. So I think of those impact sector organizations as um, the threads of the fabric that help sort of stitch some of the support together when we're talking about mental health and mental wellness in, in our communities. I begin by sharing this information because I found that our CMH brand is well known, but there's so much confusion about what we actually do in community. So in Nova Scotia, we're a small but mighty team. We've supported probably over the past couple of years about 10,000 individuals and communities around the province. We have branches in Halifax, Dartmouth, Colchester, East Hants, and Southwest Nova, and staff representation across the province from Cape Breton all the way through to Yarmouth and the French Shore. And we deliver safe, inclusive, evidence-based programming, training and support services that address the social determinants of health, including safe, affordable housing, sustainable employment, food security, and access to education and human connection. And our vision is a Canada or a Nova Scotia where mental health is a universal uh, human right. And I think that's something that we probably can all agree on here. At the division level, which is where I, I uh, operate, there are three strategic pillars and their advocacy, which is working along folks like you in government and community where we advocate for mental health system change. And I guess that's kind of why I'm here today. Uh, we also have a very strong pillar of education and that goes back to some of the mental health literacy that we were speaking of. We're committed to ensuring this programming is accessible. It's either free or subsidized and meets the evolving mental health needs of Nova Scotians. And then we also have a, a pillar that is uh, tied to resource navigation. I think when we were doing our strategic planning a few years back, a common theme that came up in conversation was nobody exactly knows where the front door is to gain access to some of the supports that they need. So we connect people in Nova Scotia with safe, inclusive, culturally relevant and accessible mental health programs, services and support. And so we're, we're responsible for working in collaboration with our government and our community allies and partners to align and strategically deliver relevant services and programs all across this province. Uh, many of you in the audience are well versed in this. But if you think about our mental health continuum, uh, where our mental health is measured in terms of thriving, where you know everything is quite normal with sleep habits and our energy and our eating, to surviving and then struggling to crisis, which is where it's at the you're you're more debilitated uh, with anxiety and depression and uh, other ailments. The center of gravity for our work is building capacity in our communities so that we have the tools to thrive and survive operating in tier one and tier two of the step care model. And by doing this, we support the healthcare system to keep people out of the hospitals and out of the emergency rooms before mental illness can occur and after the crisis has passed. So what does it look like in community for the work that we do? Essentially, the work we can do is uh, kind of categorized in either program delivery or direct service delivery. Um, with the program delivery, um, a key component, as I mentioned, is education and mental health. We offer a broad range of community-based tra training and educating education, which includes things like uh, changing minds, living life to the full, rebuilding a resilience, stress management, community suicide awareness, mental health in the workplace. And then we will also um, develop sort of custom-built programming as required. Um, we also facilitate a 
um, a platform called Thrive, and it's a recovery college, which means that the programming is developed by someone who has lived experience in conjunction with a professional uh, facilitator. And it's a virtual learning center where anyone can access free workshops to learn and gain new skills and connect with others in their community. They're developed by subject matter experts in collaboration with these uh, facilitators um, and those with lived experience. And um, uh, topics are, are really broad ranging. They range from understanding anxiety to self-care. The other piece of the education that we're quite involved in is um, suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention, and that's uh, under our CAST program, which is Communities Addressing Suicide Together. We know it's a permanent response, that suicide's a permanent response to what's a passing struggle often, and that's where intervention is critical. We play a role in the prevention and, uh, in, uh, and intervention through providing subsidized training across the province and assist resilient minds and safe talk. The other piece that is uh, might be of interest too is the peer support, which is uh, what was mentioned um, pr previously is when we bring people together who have shared experience to provide comfort and guidance, love and support for those who are sharing similar journeys. Uh, we host a variety of these across the province, including um, the Women's Empowerment Squad out of Sydney and the Circle of Friends, which has been running for over a decade. And it provides great comfort to those who are participating. The final programming piece that's uh, new for us um, is really uh, one that is in a pilot stage. We're working in uh, rural Nova Scotia, both in Cape Breton and Yarmouth, creating a, uh, being really intentional about two things, uh, not reinventing a wheel around what's already existing in community, but creating a framework of support for the informal mental health systems that already exist in communities. So in other words, taking those informal uh, peer supporters, the barbers, the, 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 the people that we tend to go to uh, when we're in need and um, give them some of the tools, provide them with the tools so that we can strengthen the fabric of our communities in that way. Our approach will also allow us to innovate these programs with a decolonized lens and giving voice to, the, voice to those who've been traditionally underserved and underheard and underrepresented. Some of the direct service uh, work that we do is uh, working with those who are unhoused or are potentially going to be unhoused due to their mental health uh, through Project Hope. We do the same with a program that is uh, working with those to provide um, employment. And, uh, and then we also have a number of social clubs, uh, community and outreach programs, and independent living support, which is um, quite prevalent in um, Colchester East Hans. Finally, we have a, a free skill building program called Bounce Back. It's provided through our national partners. It's designed to support adults with and youth 15 and plus to manage low mood, mild to moderate depression, anxiety, stress or worry. And uh, the, the candidates work with workbooks and a trained coach to guide you through uh, uh, the program and encourage you to build skills and improve mental health. It's based on the CPT. Um, so we're a nonprofit. We're a charitable organization that delivers these mental health programs and services to anyone who needs them. And funding from federal or provincial grants and donations allows us to keep most of our programs free or low barrier. And that's really important for us. So in, in closing, I'd like to say, you know, I came to this organization just over two years ago. I learned quickly that our current mental health system is complex web. And any one day we could be wrestling with, uh, in our organization, with housing a young pregnant woman in, in a mother in Kentville or developing programs for caregivers of the 2SLGBTQI plus communities in rural Nova Scotia, working with the folks from port pic to build story trail to nurture community resilience, reporting to funders, building relationships with the informal systems in our First Nations communities, meeting with domestic abuse survivors who are finding agency and leading their own peer group in North Sydney or doing the same with the newcomers group in Yarmouth, advocating for universal mental health, coordinating with our board while all managing the day-to-day -day operations of the growing organization. And I call this kind of nuance the system within our system. Where sector is known for being collaborative, but sometimes we struggle to coordinate our efforts in service of the communities. And I think that's a common theme that we need to sort of harness um, going forward. We're more than just our programming. We believe that we're an integral part of the mental health care continuum. We're committed to continuing to advocate the social determinants of health, reducing stigma, supporting mental health literacy and mental health parity and universal mental health care. However, there's no doubt there are increasing demands on charitable services that are outpacing the sector's ability to meet that demand. And so with less available to cover the charitable needs, our, mo our social fabric, fabric begins to unravel. 
We believe that solutions to many of our issues are with the resources that are already in place. Many of you have spoken of those today. But in order to leverage these solutions effectively, we need to stabilize our operations so we can focus on the coordination and strengthening of our social fabric by delivering our service to people who need it most. At CMHA Nova Scotia, we're collaborators at heart. And with over the 6,000 organizations of social impact sector across the province, we pride ourselves at being uh, collaborated, as I said, but we're not always coordinated. We also believe that in build, uh, to build healthy communities impact sector uh, to serve the needs of the province, it's important to consider the needs of the sector. Many community-based organizations work and hire people who face significant barriers themselves. In order to implement the additional mental health supports from community-based organizations that we've been speaking of, we need to continue to look for ways to invest in core operational funding, which includes that we have enough resources to ensure people have a living wage, supportive accommodations, and a reasonable quality of life in their work. Without this, it will lead to further burnout and harm, and likely making the crisis even worse by causing the harmers, the helpers, to have less capacity to help. My background is in business, and I can say safely say that running a nonprofit is way, way more complicated than running a comparable size business. When a for-profit entity finds a way to create core value for a, a customer, it's found its source of revenue, and that's the buyer. When a nonprofit finds um, a way to create value for the beneficiary, provided community-based mental health support in our case, it's not identified its economic engine. The beneficiary cannot cover the cost of the service. We must find the funds to provide the service through our means, which is a separate additional step. And achieving sustainability in the nonprofit funding model is therefore critical for the deli delivery of the social safety net of the valued programs and services that are not covered by the other pillars in society. Traditional funding models allocate money to specific projects, constraining how our funds are spent. In addition, this funding must also be renewed annually, and in principle, linking funding to service delivery for clients makes sense, but it leaves a little money to build organizational capacities and rate, uh, sorry, my time is almost up, but I'm almost there. Resisted margins diminish the organizational flexibility, capacity, and resilience manifesting as burnout, as well as limits the capacity to reimagine service delivery or receive training on new approaches and creates the absence, an absence of succession planning. Some days we're just surviving. Lots of ideas on how to address these uh, challenges. But I think we recognize as a province, it's important to continue to invest in community-based mental health initiatives. And by investing in the work of CMHA and our sister organizations across the province, we're actually supporting the healthcare system to keep people out of hospitals, out of emergency rooms, both before mental illness can occur and after the crisis has passed. Thanks so much for the conversation today. I'm so grateful to be in this co uh, company and I really look forward to the conversation going forward. Thanks very much, Karen. Um, so thanks to all our panelists. We're now going to start the Q&A portion of the event. Please uh, post your question in the Q&A box. And I see we've got some questions coming in, which is super. We ask you please direct your question to one of the speakers. Question for the panel as a whole is equivalent to asking four questions. So we just encourage you to direct it to one person. Uh, that said, panelists, of course, are free to jump in on any question they'd like. And we'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. We now get to all of them. Um, and I'm while well, a few of the questions going, I'll just sort of uh, just jump in myself. This is while folks are putting this, submitting their questions. I'm just going to maybe start by asking a question myself. And I'm going to start off by breaking my own rule and asking two people the same question, more or less, just to reflect on it. I mean, it's going to be uh, I'm going to ask Sam and Laura to just comment on if, this if they might. So we're we're talking about this the changing nature of this problem, this increased complexity. Uh, a very much larger population that sees themselves involved in this space and maybe requiring some level of help, but there seems to also be great diversity. So I would say that I'm a public administration scholar. I'm very interested in governments and what makes them tick and institutional design and things like this. And it occurs to me when uh, Karin and Alexis talk about, um, you know, the, uh, different kinds of approaches that are required in this complex space. Uh, I feel like it's how, how do we resist this temptation towards if, if in fact, this is even a bad thing, but it seems like it's leading towards an increased bureaucratization of the problem, because as you start to sort of specialize and say uh, there are different kinds of problems, different degrees of problems, we're gonna have to organize these a bit better. 
you might, I would say, you might inevitably lead to a bureaucratization in public administration. And that will maybe work against more holistic practices that we're also talking about as well. So it seems to me there's a tension at the heart of that. Is that something you see? You think that's a risk? Are we adequately pulling in a different direction that tries to achieve more holistic approach to these problems? Or are we inevitably leading to a kind of bureaucratization of this space, even more bureaucratization to deal with this complexity? Sam, do you want to offer something? I was going to start with Sam, just as the, the public administration person uh, to start us off on this. Okay. And just to be clear, like, <clears throat> I don't, uh, I'm not an expert in public administration. So, so Kevin, uh, I have. Um, just everyone take that, take my comments with a grain of salt, please. I'm naive to some degree. Um, but I'll, I'll say that um, a bureaucracy should support uh, connections uh, between different uh, disparate, disconnected uh, systems of care provision in that broad definition of what care means, uh, rather than present barriers. So an example, okay, is a uh, current state uh, a, um, a youth in uh, the Tri-County area who is in school, has been struggling with their mental health for uh, over a year, has been seeing one of the uh, school psychologists there, who's a regulated healthcare professional, a psychologist, providing care up to and including diagnostics, has, knows this patient very well, um, and uh, and that 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 psychologist is an employee of the early childhood, or well, they're really they're they're an employee of the school board, okay. And uh, the uh, the psychologist uh, has discerned that the individual gets to a point where they require a higher level of intensity of care than can be provided by them in the community and through that sort of school delivered care, and so. Um, the option available is to telephone a central intake line and for the uh, individual, the youth, to actually speak on the phone with, uh, with, a, with someone on the other end of the line who uh, helps to uh, understand you know, what's going on and helps to try to direct that person to the appropriate level of care, which usually means uh, uh, if they are someone who's a good candidate for, uh, for a formal publicly funded mental health addictions care into you know, like a clinic to be assessed or perhaps they need hospitalization. The psychologist is sitting there in the room and they're being told uh, that because they're not part of the Nova Scotia Health Authority, they're not part of the health system, they can't speak during that, that intake assessment. They're not allowed to provide input and that the central intake person has no interest in getting information from them, right? So to me, that's like, that's where a bureaucracy, you know, really is getting in the way, right? Uh, of, of, the person that matters here, which is the individual, the youth, right? Not these systems, right? And which have their own processes. So, um, you know, one of the really, I, I won't give the long speech, but like one of the most important pieces about any kind of overarching vision, right? Of a complex system that accounts for, you know, uh, different uh, people being matched to the right kind of uh, care and supports that they need, including in the formal system, outside the formal system, um, community-based organizations and so on, is that um, we actually streamline the experience for patients. That's, the, that's first and foremost. The other thing that we, you know, like that we would really need to do with a bureaucracy is to ensure that we actually are more streamlined with what are our outcomes? What's our plan? What is, how do we evaluate uh, success or not in a way that's much more standardized? So Karn paints a good picture of how uh, disheartening and stressful and exhausting it is to work in a community-based organization that works with a population of people that they know well, that they have good credibility and rapport with, that there's really good work being done. And the organization has to go from grant to grant, year to year, eating up human resources, unable to recruit and retain people long-term because everyone's on a, on a, on a, a contract, right? And um, that is... And so a, a bureaucracy that would seek to uh, um, bring community-based organizations into the formal system um, ultimately would be help to situate a community-based organization to do to get paid <laughs> to do the work that it should be doing. And for that evaluation to be something that is standardized as opposed to multiple grants, which require people to report in different ways, and, uh, and all of that, so that we're actually freeing people up to do the work they need to do. 
Um, so it's idealistic, but that's that's the yardstick, right? So um, it's really uh, bureaucracy where it matters, um, I guess you could say. Thanks, Laura. Do you have any thoughts on this streamlining and bureaucratization and specialization pulling away from holistic approaches? Uh, sorry. Um, I think, I, I, well, I think there's always going to be a lot of complexity because mental health is, well, their minds are, are complex. And, and so even um, discussing this, there's so many different um, complexities. It's hard to um, pare it down, right? Like, and, and use of language and, and the same sort of thing will happen with um, bureaucracy. It sort of spins out of complexity, I think, as we try to find ways to um, address it. So I think, I think complexity is probably going to be and bureaucracy is probably going to be inevitable. And back to my area of most interest, which is how do we prepare our, um, and I'll say physicians, because that's where I'm involved is medical education. How do we prepare our physicians to contribute meaningfully to this system? And how do we, um, you know, become uh, contributors without having to be uh, you know, the experts are the people making the decisions, but how do we, we contribute and, and fun, function effectively in these complex systems? Because I think we're probably stuck with with complexity and, and bureaucracy, to be honest. Thank you. Uh, I want to try to get to some some of the questions that we've, we've gotten coming in. Um, I think this uh, question for you, Sam, will the skills taught in DBT be normalized and shared broadly, especially regarding emotion education and how to regulate them? Or at least Sam, you've offered a, 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 some thoughts on this. You can offer some thoughts on this. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question. And um, I think when we think about, uh, so for those of you who don't know, like DBT is uh, uh, an acronym for dialectical behavioral therapy, which is uh, developed by a, a clinician in, uh, by the name of Marshall Linehan. It's uh, often... Um, it's, it's positioned as one of the uh, core uh, uh, interventions for people who have a particular kind of a, um, uh, a mental health uh, challenge uh, uh, referred to as borderline personality disorder. Uh, dialectic behavioral therapy itself borrows from a number of other therapeutic uh, uh, techniques, including for emotional regulation, distress tolerance, as well as learning how to relate to other people, which is sometimes referred to as interpersonal effectiveness. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, it, it, it's my assertion as a clinician that a lot of the skills would be really helpful for a lot of people, okay? <laughs> and uh, I think that, you know, when we talk about sort of uh, really um, kind of interventions that would would benefit a population and build resilience, you know, a lot of those would would uh, really apply well to those as well who live with, with mental illness. Um, but uh, here's an example. Uh, one of our uh, government, Nova Scotia government mandate items is to uh, develop a, um, a curriculum uh, aimed at uh, school, uh, school aged uh, kids in the middle school kind of uh, period to um, uh, that's related to uh, understanding the harms associated with drugs and alcohol. And so this, this was a mandate item that came from our elected officials. And what we're actually really focusing on is rather than um, kind of uh, 1980s style talks about how drugs are bad, and um, which actually has been shown to be actually not beneficial, uh, we're actually focusing on uh, finding ways to uh, identify um, um, the need for uh, particular skills and really apply those uh, and, and teach those, uh, particularly in a peer setting uh, or as much as possible leveraging peer uh, work uh, to teach skills to individuals uh, in the school system who are vulnerable to developing addiction. And really the skills are not about understanding cognitively, having occasion about how cannabis might be harmful to you. They're really about uh, a lot of the skills that are related to what you would find in dialectical behavioral therapy, such as learning how to uh, uh, tolerate distress, learning how to regulate one's emotions, learning how to uh, feel and be more connected to others. And we know that like, for example, folks with a significant history of adverse childhood events are more prone to developing substance use disorders or addictions if they're exposed to substances. And so rather than focus on um, 
uh, folks understanding that drugs are bad and when they do actually get exposed and develop an addiction, probably end up feeling bad about themselves. We actually are giving people, um, uh, we're, we're, our, our plan is to give people life skills to actually uh, bolster them and, and kind of shore up their resistance to actually developing a reliance on the use of substances that are psychotropic in order to uh, palliate um, challenges in their life. Uh, thanks very much, Sam. Uh, we do have other questions to get through. I want to just note to people, we are going to keep going to 1.15, so we still have another 20 minutes, so please keep your questions coming in. I think this question is for Laura, and uh, Alexis might want to chip in as well on uh, this one. Uh, do you feel if putting more, do you feel that putting more emphasis on bringing in more uh, psychiatrists would help? How would you educate the public in the scope of psychiatrists and the difference between psychiatrists and other counseling professions? Yeah, I, I saw that question in the the chat, <laughs> I thought it was a really interesting question because, um, I mean, I think the answer is yes and no. <laughs> yes, it would help and no, it would help. Like, um, and, and I see there's a similar, what was to my mind sort of a similar uh, point in the further down in the chat about um, the analogy between somebody going to their primary care provider with, with diabetes. And, and the thing about psychiatry is that like, there, there are different models even for psychiatrists to practice. So there are psychiatrists who are, are out there who are in sort of a fee-for-service model where they, they have an office, you know, they're by themselves in their office and they have, a, you know, maybe a receptionist, but then they don't work in a multidisciplinary team. They, they bill MSI. And that, that's more like your family medicine practice model, like your traditional family medicine model. And um, that, but then there's people like myself who work sort of within the mental health and addictions program who work in a community mental health clinic where there are psychiatrists, but there's many more other non-psychiatrist personnel. So there's nurses and there's social workers and there's occupational therapists and there's, you know, psychologists and counselors and so on. So in a setting like that, I mean, back to the analogy of someone coming with um with diabetes, like maybe you would see someone else first. You wouldn't see the psychiatrist right off the bat. You'd see maybe, you know, so, so that's actually how our community health, mental health clinics work. That certainly not everybody, in, and Sam could probably even say the stats better than I could, but, you know, it would be the minority of people who see a psychiatrist who are referred to community mental health. Most people are going to see other clinicians and the psychiatrist will be more likely to see, you know, people with psychosis or or mania or something and so I, so i think um you know we we there's personally i do believe that psychiatrists should also be trained in psychotherapy i actually have a fellowship in cognitive behavioral therapy from um university of toronto and i i used to train residents in cognitive behavioral therapy so i actually do very strongly believe in you know, psychiatrists using a biopsychosocial model, being able to do psychotherapy, you know, having an awareness of the, and I think most psychiatrists would, the influence of, you know, your the the living arrangements and complex trauma and, and you know, employment, secure housing, all of those things. But, but that being said, we'll never have, if we think that the, the psychiatrists would be the people who would be providing all of the mental health care <laughs> for everybody who has, has, even significant, even illness. There's just no way like that. We will never have enough psychiatrists for that. And we wouldn't want to have a system built on psychiatrists providing all of that care. So, but I would say that also though, that we do, um, we do need more psychiatrists in my opinion. Like we, we do need um, uh, one, uh, we haven't even like, so we, we haven't talked about inpatient care but we do have a shortage in my opinion of inpatient beds. Um, we need uh, psychiatrists who can work in some of the the settings in the you know the community, um, like um, working with people who are unhoused. Like there, there's a lot of I do think there is need for for psychiatrists, more psychiatrists, other parts of the province. We also need more psychiatrists, honestly, to be able to train people because we we're we're getting increasing requests for training medical students and residents and other people. And I know addictions has the same same challenges. They have a lot of requests for, and, and you know, we at least have some funding. They they need funding for that. So there's a lot of, you know, needs for for people as well to provide the training. So so I think and and to be able to do the administrative, 
and the advocacy work, because that is, as I said, in a complex system, I think that that's something that psychiatrists should be contributing to as well. So, so yes and no, I think we could use, I think we do need more psychiatrists, but I don't think that more psychiatrists is the solution. And um, also, you know, how do we educate people? I struggle with that because, you know, it's um, people do often have like a maybe a Hollywood version of, you know, I don't want to be, you know, to downplay it, but when you watch old movies, you do see these psychiatrists who, you know, are, are seeing people for long periods of time and they're lying on a couch and they're providing a lot of sort of very profound insights. And, uh, you know, I think even though we know that's not the reality today, that that sort of archetype is maybe still floating around our culture, this idea that the psychiatrist would be able to provide something that other mental health providers or other other clinicians couldn't provide. So those are my thoughts. Alexis, thoughts on that? Sorry, sure. Unmute myself. Sure, yes. I yeah, I agree with everything that Laura just shared. I, I really do in my own you know, training as family medicine and then how I would view psychiatry, they really are such a, a specialist resource that they have a specialist perspective and they can offer really great insight to, you know, perhaps cases that we've seen that are challenging to treat or they're refractory, we're not getting a, a certain desire, but really to utilize that resource that it, you know, that it is, a, it is a dear resource that we don't want to overextend and that they have a skill set that can be really used for, cl for clients that nobody else can really see. I guess that's part of it to remember that there's, um, you know, if, if folks are, you know, having um, symptoms that can be managed by their family practice or psychologists, counselors, social workers, there are certain clients that only psychiatrists really can help and really can work with. Um, so just keeping that in mind, just as a resource and allocation of resources. Great, thank you. Question for you, Karin. Can you speak about why we need the federal mental health transfer to finally be included in the federal budget? Yeah, uh, so in 2021, um, I think that, oh. can you hear me? Yeah, okay, <laughs> sorry. In 2021, the, uh, the Liberals had a platform where they wanted to sort of permanently fund um, mental health through the Canadian mental health transfer. And they promised 4.5 billion over five years. And then the most recent um, budget that came down, uh, uh, 2.5 came through over 10 years. So they're not really addressing, you know, we were really, really hopeful at that time that that money would actually, you know, help to sort of fund and, and stabilize the work that we do in the community. And it's, it's just not coming through. And so part of the work that we do at the CMHA National is really to advocate in Ottawa to um, get some of these funds dedicated to the work that we do at the community level so that it strengthens the overall sort of fabric of our community and, and the work that we do in, in each uh, part of Nova Scotia. So I think that it's not sort of meeting our needs at this point, and we're always looking for ways to um, stabilize and uh, and focus on less on trying to figure out where the money's coming from and more on just doing the work that we're all talking about doing in service of our communities. Uh, oops. Thanks, uh, thanks, Karen. Uh, I've got a question here that I think in some ways revisits my question about bureaucracy. And uh, just to summarize, it seems there may be some uh, there are some institutional constraints that prevent us from working collaboratively. And I think that might be a question for anyone who wants to take it. Um, I think that uh, you, you want to, do you have thoughts on this, Sam, to start us off about what we need to do better to bring in community groups like Karen's or other community groups, people working at the sort of street level, trying to engage with communities and, and help communities. How, what's, what's preventing this from happening? What do we need to do better? Mm. Well, I, I, I don't want to talk too long because I think it would be good to hear from Karn about that actually more, you know, but uh, we're, we're working uh, across the, uh, uh, you know, to create a, a cross province um, uh, system of care that will provide as much integration as possible with both uh, existing um healthcare providers who are working in the private sector, as well as community-based organizations and um, opportunities for collaboration with universities and colleges with their clinical training programs um, in order to uh, really generate 
an integrated system, right? So that's a really nice word to say, right? There's so much, I mean, one could write a book about all of the different barriers, right? To, uh, to um, you know, connecting. I mean, I, I kind of told that story, right? Uh, and I think what's important is that we're, we're um, you know, from the community-based organization kind of lens, when I, when I first started uh, uh, working with the Office of Addictions and Mental Health, we had some, I brought in, you know, some folks to do some strategic planning. And really the core question was, what is the mental health system? Like, what do you think it is? And really across, you know, the sort of the Department of Health and Wellness, the mental health system was really conceptualized in terms of what the health authority is doing with the mental health addictions program and the IWK and their formal mental health addictions program. There wasn't even mention of primary care, not to mention, not to mention all of those who actually do work every day, right? Uh, and uh, and so um, I've socialized, and I'm not saying it's all me, but like it's I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, but worked really hard to really change that thinking. And so from a government side, we're we're saying, you know, we're gonna speak to community-based organizations and really learn what are the needs that you're meeting. We're doing a very granular multi-year needs-based assessment community by community and trying to figure out uh, from there, what, what are the resources, what are the services that are needed for communities and trying to match that, right? So we're, uh, we're really looking at, uh, uh, at uh, reducing the uh, administrative burden that community-based organizations are uh, engaged in and to uh, improve uh, communication and collaboration so that if there's an artificial barrier or wall between um, the formal system and informal systems uh, or uh, community-based systems uh, or entities uh, that, uh, that we actually cut through those and, uh, and actually formalize that. Um, and that can come in part through, uh, through policy changes with the health authorities, which we, you know, we're partners on in, in bringing forward uh, this thing that we're calling universal mental health care, which is kind of a brand, uh, branding term for all of what we're talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, so, uh, we're doing so informed by the community-based organizations that we're connecting with, right? Uh, and the same holds true for uh, um, uh, providing uh, the capacity for private mental health practitioners, such as social workers, registering counseling therapists, and psychologists, and others who work in the community, and who right now basically can only, you can only see them if you have an extended health can plan that pays for them or you pay out of pocket. And so uh, if we're going to have a system by which uh, people can actually, for example, be remunerated by the government uh, and provide to provide care, even though they're not employees of the formal mental health addiction system, we're not just going to give them billing codes and say, you know, uh, off you go, which is sort of what primary care is kind of like in Nova Scotia, speaking as a family doctor, but actually be part of the same system so that central intake is something that gets that matches people to what needs they whatever needs they have, regardless of whether that's within the formal system or our uh, partners, right? It also means that uh, people can actually uh, be seen and identified as a resource. Uh, for example, for a hospitalized patient who's hospitalized for a mental illness, like a psychiatric acute psychiatric event, we could actually leverage community resources and and uh, generate those connections because they're actually part of the system. The good news is that most healthcare providers just want to solve problems and are willing to get on the phone and talk to people, right? And a lot of it is, as well as it, just a lack of awareness. Like, I think Karn's really right to sort of point out, people don't really know what the CMHA does, right? And that includes, like, for example, a, um, you know, a physician who's uh, working in, in, on, on an inpatient unit and perhaps doesn't isn't aware of what the lo what local resources are actually available uh, for patients. It, Patient may still need to be discharged into the care of a psychiatrist, but they also may have adjunctive care that's not necessarily being delivered through a community mental health addictions clinic run by the health authority. It could be uh, another entity. Karen, do you want to pick up this point about what, from your point of view, can governments be doing to increase its reach, better integration with community groups? How, what else can governments be doing? I think, well, you know, I've been experiencing some of it, which was is terrific because I've really seen the, uh, certainly the Office of Addictions and Mental Health do outreach to the community-based organizations and start to um, 
yeah, and and they I'm sure they have been for a while, but as, you know, asking questions around uh, who 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 are we and what do we do and who do we connect with and and uh, what our needs are. But there's the other piece of it that is really important that I I keep coming back to is like there's no point in having those conversations if we're we're trying to survive on a day by day basis, and some of us are. And uh, so I think there's two sort of two pieces that we have to pay attention to. One is having that seat at the table and having a voice around the table in terms of how we can work together and be uh, more uh, collaborative. And, 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 and someone said it in the very beginning, like it's something that we all want. It's, it's connecting to our hearts and our humanity and doing what's in service of our communities. And that's the way, you know, I speak with my team all the time is it's that that's our, that's our purpose. But the other part of it is we can't do that if we are surviving on grant to grant to grant to grant. Like the, it just does not make sense. And so if the government is relying on us to be part of this framework and this network, then we have to be supported accordingly. And um, unless that happens, then the system will always be broken in my in my humble opinion. I have a question for you, Alexis. It's about, uh, you referred to uh, uh, including spiritual care in our approach to mental health issues and our overall well-being. How do you imagine, how does that interact with the sort of professional uh, bureaucratic arrangements that we've been talking about in this discussion? How do we integrate that dimension into our uh, public approach to these issues? And from your from your particular perspective, yeah, it's a it's a really great question. So I think it's been annexed for so long; it's hard for us to understand how to even do it. I think through, I mean, the research that's emerging right now with psychedelic assisted medicine and the non ordinary states of consciousness that people are alighting to, either through plant based medicine or more synthetic newer psychedelics, the research is capturing this first person direct experience that they're having, essentially a divine experience, a, a non ordinary state where they're connecting in an ineffable way, a way that's hard to describe, with a much much larger landscape than really any of us have been trained around or that we have a language around. So because there's now data actually, you know, following some of this work and that people who have actually the most significant shifts with psychedelic assisted medicine are those that tend to alight to these uh, what we would call spiritual spaces or direct first person spiritual experiences. I think it really you know, behooves us to begin talking about this and what is this space and, and can we can we uh, have a space for it in our conversations and assessments. And we only have to pause for a moment to realize that actually all indigenous healing traditions have never left that space. They've never actually not named it and not had it part of our healing their healing practice. So rather than us maybe try to reinvent a wheel, I think it must make more sense to just look at traditional practices that have been you know practicing shamanic healing traditions for estimated you know 30 40 thousand years like long long practices and how would they maybe speak about spirit or how would they in, encourage spirit into that that lens so i think this might be a time rather for than us to to problem solve and hack is is really just ask and listen and and those um Traditions that have not been, um, you know, despite a lot of, you know, conflict and, and and effort to suppress over the years, those that have not been suppressed actually give them uh, the opportunity to share with us how that might happen. I guess just a practical application of this is a group called Roots to Thrive out of British Columbia that has done this, that they've been looking and curious about how can we talk about a mind, body, spirit connection with mental health. And they began piloting, I believe their first pilots were with um, healthcare professionals, nurses who were experiencing PTSD, um, I believe major depressive symptoms, and then using uh, plant-based medicines as well as traditional healing practices with indigenous elders as part of the framework and um, using small community practices. So I believe the group size would be like six to eight, maybe 10 people, a cohort of practice embedded with uh, therapy within and really pulling on this, this bimodal model of a Western model and a traditional uh, sacred model um, with, with really interesting success. So that model has been kind of operationalized uh, in British Columbia, but we're paying attention to that and trying to maybe create similar pilots here if we have uh, some support and, and maybe some interest. Thanks so much. Uh, we have come to the end. We normally run one hour panels at the McKechnie Institute uh, over lunch, but we 
we assumed there would be lots of interest and of course there was and we got lots of questions and we we're uh, grateful for everyone's questions i'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them uh, a recording of the, our event will be put on the mckechnan institute website please also note that we'll be issuing a briefing note uh, uh, today uh, summarizing the roundtable discussion we hosted in june of the fear conference I want to say thanks so much to all the panelists today for sharing your uh, insights and wisdom on this issue on this uh, day where we're reflecting on uh, mental health. We really appreciate your time and expertise. We also know you're extremely busy, so we're really grateful for it. We also are really grateful for the audience that uh, logged in and stayed with us. We had strong participation throughout the event, so we're really grateful for that. On that note, uh, thanks for so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again at the McKechnie Institute. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.